Thank you, Joe and Susan, as well, for the music. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful people. We're thankful, Lord. You've awakened us. You've brought us into your house today, Lord. We are praising your name, Lord. We are singing songs of praise. We are lifting our hearts, Lord. And, and again, just thankful, Lord. Thankful to be here another day. Uh, your blessings are many, Lord. Your opportunities are as well. And we always pray that we would have the spiritual eyes and ears to see and hear them. So many go by us, Lord, and we really don't have time to lament missing them when another one comes by. So, Lord, just use us as you see fit. You've called us into your, your family, Lord. Uh, you've called us into this eternal family. And what a joy to be with our brothers and sisters. What a joy to know that there are more out there, more whom you have called, who you are calling, and have not yet heard the wonderful gospel message. So, Lord, bring us alongside those people. Have us be compassionate and bring them comfort, Lord, as you once brought us comfort as well, as you sent somebody alongside us to share the gospel message. Lord, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing to be part of the family of God, and it's a wonderful thing to be brought into this great plan of redemption in such a way that, that we can play an integral part in it. And so, Lord, we're grateful and thankful again for all of the opportunities. Lord, we do pray for all who are here this morning. Uh, I always want to remember that people come in, in different conditions. Some of us are uh, having the best day of our lives. Others may may be in a situation where that's not the case. We all struggle with something, Lord. We all have challenges that, that we face. We all have trials, certainly. I think of our dear sister, Dana, who was burying her father later this week. She is going through a very severe trial right now, Lord. And pray, Lord, that you would give me the words to say at that service and that uh, you would bring comfort to that family. We are thankful, Lord, for giving our brother Gary good good results when he saw his doctor this week, Lord, and we pray that uh, he will have many, many productive days ahead of him yet. And our brother Dwayne, who is back with us this morning, Lord, it's always good to see Dwayne and, and uh, just the faithfulness all of these brothers and sisters show, Lord. It's, uh, it's encouraging to me. It's an inspiration, Lord. We, we do battle different things in life, and uh, to be able to know that we have the Lord who will never leave us nor forsake us by our side every step of the way is so reassuring. So we thank you for that, Lord. Ask for a blessing for all who are here and whatever uh, might be on their hearts this morning, Lord. Just um, strengthen them, encourage them, give them your peace. Lord, I continue to pray for our nation and the leaders that uh, don't always do a great job of leading because they seek human wisdom in these very important matters. Lord, I pray that they would uh, turn to you and seek the Lord's wisdom. And Lord, that you would uh, encourage us as we pray each and every day uh, for our nation. And I pray that you would continue to have mercy on us, Lord. We're not, we're not very deserving of it, but Lord, we we still pray for it, and we, uh, we know that there are many righteous people still in this land. Uh, strengthen the land, Lord. Strengthen the church. The church has dropped the ball on so many occasions, Lord. I often think that maybe we're in the condition we are as a, as a nation because the church has not done its job. So forgive us, Lord, but strengthen our resolve. Make us, uh, make us stronger in our pursuit, Lord, for what is right, what is right in your eyes, not what is right in man's eyes. Human wisdom gets us nowhere, but godly wisdom and godly discernment uh, takes, us, takes us to good places. So we thank you for that, Lord. I want to lift our missionaries to you, all the ones we support, all the ones that we don't even know about, Lord. They're all over the world, 
I pray for their safety today. They face heavy persecution oftentimes. Some will be martyred for their faith today. And Lord, I would just pray that you would uh, put your hedge about them, give them strength, give them boldness to continue to uh, profess their faith in you and share that wonderful message with others. Lord, we are a blessed people that we know you, and we are even more blessed that we have the opportunities to tell others. So be with the missionaries around the world, the ones here at home, and we are all missionaries, Lord, and that we have family, we have neighbors and friends and co-workers and fellow students that uh, that need to hear the gospel, Lord, just as we needed to hear it. And have us take that good news out and share it with others. Just, again, Lord, are, are such a thankful and blessed people to be in your house this morning. We pray that all that we think, say, and do uh, would be pleasing to your sight, and we would continue to lift your name on high. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And again, good to see everyone who is here and everyone online. I don't always remember to welcome all those who are online with us, um, but it's always good to know folks are out there. Whether they can actually make it inside or not, that's okay. Um, as, as I say that, I see more people making it inside, so praise the Lord. Um, the announcements, again, welcome. If you're here for the first time, I don't know that I saw any first-time visitors, but we do have a visitor's card available for you in the pew. Uh, the pew rack in front of you, the back of the card, as always, put your prayer requests on it. We will take those uh, to prayer. I can promise you that. We do have our last summer movie this Friday. Uh, out here on the lawn, if it's bad weather, we'll come inside. It's at 8 o'clock. Uh, the sun is going down earlier, so we can start a bit earlier. We'll be showing The Case for Christ, uh, which will be a story about Lee Strobel. He was the atheist who was upset that his wife was following the Lord, and so he went out to disprove her wrong. And, of course, what happens sometimes in those cases, as he comes to the Lord himself. So praise God for using him. He's written a lot of good books as well, uh, defending the faith. We do have a solid ground ministry meeting next Sunday after church up front here. As we prepare, we do have uh, what we are billing as crabs and more uh, about midway through September. So it'll be a, a mini crab feast, but for those of you who don't eat crabs, we will have other food as well. So um, tell your neighbors, uh, tell your friends, and we will have that outside as well. So that will be coming up uh, about midway through September. September is going to be a very busy month. We have, of course, our God and Country service on September 11th, and all this will be in the bulletin next week. Um, Bill Federer will be here again. That will be 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 11th of September, again outside, weather permitting in here, if the weather does not cooperate. So uh, it'll be another good service, I am sure. I think that's all I have. The baby bottles are, are coming back in still, and we appreciate uh, all the effort all of you make regarding that great ministry as we help the Centers for Pregnancy Concerns reach out to all these um, many of them are young girls, young women, for sure, um, who are with child and they're lost, either physically or spiritually, many of them, uh, emotionally, they're afraid, they don't know what to do, and yet this ministry reaches out to them and helps them through their pregnancy, even beyond the delivery, um, caring for the welfare of the child, clothing, diapers, those types of things, uh, milk and formula, they, and, and counseling, a lot of good Christian counseling. They share the gospel with all these young ladies. So thank you for helping to support that this summer as well. I think that's all I have. And please stand for our scripture reading, which is Romans chapter 1, verses 7 through 16. Romans chapter 1 beginning with verse 7. 
to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Please be seated. Now Pastor Dave will bless us with his message, God's perfect plan. You know, we have a wonderful opportunity to speak to the Lord, not just every day, but anytime we want, don't we? He's given us that great avenue of prayer where we can go directly to him. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, of course, he said, uh, it is finished. The Greek word was to telestai that he used. It's finished. The debt's been paid. And now with that, we were told that the the curtain in the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. It was a very thick curtain. Uh, nothing man could have done, tearing that in half. The Lord did that. And it was done symbolically to show us that we now could enter into the holiest of holies, where only the high priest was allowed to go previously to go before God. But we have that privilege now. We can go before God. Uh, without the help of anyone else, uh, he is there always. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He's always there ready for us to come before his throne with our praises, with our petitions. And you know, being human, we always seem to want to read that laundry list of, of what, we, what we want, right? Um, and, you know, that's going to happen. You're going to throw some of those in there. But let's praise the Lord and thank him for who he is and what he does. And he knows what's on our hearts. He knows what it is we want. He also knows, more importantly, what it is we need. And um, he just wants to hear from us, just like a parent wants to hear from a child. It's, it's quite natural in that regard. Um, but when you pray, I just want to let you all know not to be surprised at how God answers these prayers. You know, we expect certain things, don't always get it, at least not the way we would, we would do it. And that's good, because I know just from my own past, the way I've done things, it doesn't always work out real well. So we're glad to have the Lord and his perfect plan. In the text that Joe read for us, Paul is speaking to the Christian believers in Rome, and um, he's telling them how he prayed to God for a safe journey, a prosperous journey, uh, to come to visit them in Rome, that he might spend some time with them, that he might teach them. But when he did arrive, it certainly was not with any pomp and circumstance. They didn't bring him in on a float. He has arrived, no. He came in as a prisoner. He prayed for a safe trip, and he did ultimately arrive safely, but only after first being shipwrecked 
and bitten by a poisonous snake, among a few other things. But he was where he wanted to be. He wanted to be in Rome with the Roman believers. And he was where the Lord, more importantly, had promised that he would be. God had promised Paul he would be in Rome. The risen Christ had appeared to Paul four times. If you read the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the early first century church, four times Christ had appeared to Paul. The first time, of course, which we all know about and, and seem to remember more than the others, was on his way to Damascus. He was converted at that point from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. He also appeared to Paul in Corinth and twice in Jerusalem did Christ appear to Paul. On his first visit, on Paul's first visit to Jerusalem and then again on his last. And it was during that last visit that Paul made to Jerusalem that he began his third missionary voyage. Now, he had hoped to go to Rome. He wanted to see and, and spend some time with the believers there, but he was arrested while he was in Jerusalem. So at that point, you can well imagine what Paul must have thought his chances were of getting to Rome anytime soon. He firmly believed he was in God's will. No doubt about that. But his plans were obviously about to take a detour. So I have to ask you the question, does that ever happen to you? It happens to me. I make plans. Sometimes it seems like, it's like on a daily basis. You make a plan to do this or that or the other thing, and here come the detours. And detours are something apart from our incredibly smart phones we carry with us. I know some of them can tell you about road construction and things going on, accidents, but for the most part, you don't know you're going to be sent on a detour until you get there, until you arrive at whatever place um, has, has been put up as a roadblock, so to speak, for your will. So yes, that does happen to all of us, that our plans take a detour. So just use your imagination a little bit. Um, let's suppose that you have some friends that live halfway across the country and you're telling them that you are going to be paying them a visit. And then while you're on your way, again, this is just suppose this happens, suppose that happens. While you're on your way, the police pull you over and they arrest you in what turns out to be a case of mistaken identity. Now, you will ultimately have this error resolved, but in the meantime, you're sitting somewhere out there in a jail cell in another state without enough money to make bail. What thoughts might be going through your mind? Again, we, you know, the detours that we encounter could be anything. You don't know what is going to happen. And so it's not even something you can plan for. So what might you be thinking? Well, let's revise this little hypothetical that we're talking about here. Let's take the jail out of the equation. We'll make that a little easier, right? Maybe your plans involved a well-deserved and a promised promotion where you work. That's probably happened to a few of us, right, down through the years. But well, right before this great promotion was about to materialize, your company decided to merge with a competitor. And now they're telling you your office is going to be eliminated. These things happen, right? They they probably happen more often than not. Now, you could stay on, of course, they tell you, but at a reduction in pay. Well, that certainly isn't part of your plans, is it? The point of all of this, of course, is that as we travel through our lives, always, every day, every hour of every day, going from point A to point B, going from where we are to where 
we are headed next, point A to point B. We sometimes get off, get knocked off of that course, don't we? Uh, we set out thinking it'll be a gravy train, but that's not always what happens. There are external factors that affect each of us, either directly or indirectly, and this can happen every day of your life. There are factors that happen that will happen to you today that will affect you sometime in the future. You don't even know about them. They may be happening miles away, hours away, nations away. You don't know. But that, of course, is what we are faced with. Those of you who were in the military maybe have a clearer understanding of that than, uh, than the rest. Uh, when orders come through to go here or go there, um, you don't know what or how those orders are going to be affected by what's going on in the world around us. So we have no control over these factors. These things happen to everyone, Christians and non-Christians alike. But as Christians, we must always remember that we have access to the one who controls our lives. And he also controls all of the events that take place in our lives. He's sovereign. He is providentially ruling the universe every minute of every day and all that is in it. But it doesn't mean things will always happen the way we want them to. And that's where Paul found himself as well. Remember this, when you pray sincerely, and be sincere in your prayer, take the time. You want God to hear you, well then take the time to be sincere about what you're about to say. When you pray sincerely, God will answer. But sometimes it will be in timing and in ways that you don't expect. But we can expect God to honor his promises. That we know for sure. And in Romans 8, 28, which I seem to quote every week, he tells us that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord them who are the called according to the Lord's purpose. We have to remember that according to his purpose. God works out all things, not just isolated incidents. He works out all things for our ultimate good. Again, that word ultimate is important. Doesn't happen overnight. Doesn't mean though as well that all things that happen to us is good. We have a lot of bad things that happen to us along the way, but God can work that for good. Evil is prevalent in a sinful world, and we have seen examples of that evil our entire lives. But God is able to turn that around, again, for our long-range good. Don't get discouraged. Things may happen to you today. Don't get discouraged. God is still in control of all of it. And again, we have to remember that God is not in the business of making us happy. That's not what this is all about. If we find some joy along the way, praise the Lord. But he's not in the business of making us happy. It is his will that will be accomplished. He's working to fulfill his purpose. And in the process, our journey will go much more smoothly if we can learn to accept and not to resent the pain and the persecution that may come with it. Because we know that God is with us. Never forget that. He is always with us. Our text then again, that Joe read, is Paul's prayer for God's will to be done, which should always be our prayer as well. Now, remember, Paul had prayed to visit Rome. Again, he wanted to teach his brothers and sisters in Christ. He wanted to go there and 
share the word with them. He prayed for a safe trip. And as we know, he did arrive safely. After getting arrested, slapped in the face, shipwrecked, and again, bitten by that poisonous snake. I don't think I'd want to be bitten by an unpoisonous snake or a non-poisonous. When you sincerely pray, as I said earlier, God will answer. But sometimes in ways and in timing that we don't expect. God's answer to Paul in God's time and in God's way is found in the chapters that precede Romans 1. Of course, that's the final chapters that we read in the book of Acts. It's there we read of Paul's third missionary journey and his voyage to Rome. And Paul knew that he would be heading there as a prisoner. His purpose for going was to stand trial before Caesar. Now, that was Paul's right because Paul was a Roman citizen. So he had the right to stand trial before Caesar. The Jews wanted him killed for evangelizing, but that was not a crime against Rome. They didn't care about that. It certainly wasn't a crime that was punishable by death. So traveling from Caesarea to Rome, if you look at your map of the Mediterranean, it wasn't a terribly long trip, but again, because of all the external factors, all of the detours during this trip, it took about six months. He stopped 12 times along the way. I made that trip several times when I was stationed over there. It's an overnight trip at most, six months. And it was made using three different ships. Upon leaving their second port of call in southern Turkey, they ran into fierce winds. Of course, they weren't powered like the ships today are, where you can combat that. And they were driven off course. After several days of rough sailing, they started losing hope. So they found a port, they found some temporary safety off the southwest coast of Turkey. But they only stayed there a few days. Paul warned them, don't go back out to sea, but they did anyway. Now again, we have to remember and understand what Paul had going for him here, right? He understood the power. He understood the authority of the God whom he worshiped. He so believed God, he so believed in God, that Paul sold out to him. Sometimes people will ask me why Paul was used so mightily by God, why Paul saw the miracles that he saw, why God blessed Paul in ways that the rest of us can only dream about. When they ask me that, I ask them, are you willing to sell out like Paul did every day of your life? If you want to be used like Paul or Moses or Deborah or Rahab, then do what they did. Be willing to subject your will to God's will and do so completely, 100%. And before you say you're not as worthy as those that God used, please think again. Moses was a murderer. Paul authorized and caused the deaths of multiple Christians. He oversaw the stoning of Stephen. We read about in Acts 7. Rahab was a prostitute. And Jesus 12, chose 12 disciples, none of them perfect, but all of them were teachable. There's a, a key there. And all were willing to lay aside their own self-interest. They were all willing to lay aside their concerns for the calling that God had on their lives and has on each of our lives as well. So commit yourself to him. See what he'll do. 
Paul's great desire to go to Rome, along with God sovereignly saying, not yet, obviously all the detours, not yet, all of that resulted in Paul writing this letter that Joe read from this morning that he wrote to the Romans, a letter that is instrumental to our faith. All that came about because of the timing of God, not of Paul. Maybe there are some no's, maybe there are some detours in your life that God is planning to use in a mighty way. If we would just faithfully do what lies directly ahead of us, putting one foot in front of the other, instead of worrying about why we didn't get our way. I know it's human nature. We all do it. I want this. It didn't happen. Now I'm mad. Now I'm upset. Now my mind is off festering somewhere instead of looking for the next opportunity to serve the Lord. It happens to all of us. But we need to do better. Because of Paul's intimate relationship with God, he also knew that God was good for his word. Paul knew he was going to get to Rome because God had told him he would. Read some of those final chapters in the book of Acts. In Acts 23, 11, God told him he would go to Rome. And Paul, after Paul had testified before the Sanhedrin, the Lord came to him the following night and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. As you have testified of me here in Jerusalem, so you will also bear witness of me in Rome. And then in Acts 27, 24, God reinforced that promise. But on his way, in the midst of a terrible storm out at sea, just before they were shipwrecked on the island of Malta, which lies just south of Italy, the Lord again came to Paul. He said, don't be afraid. You will still get to Rome. You will still get to stand trial before Caesar. And even though the ship you're on is going to go down, everyone on board will be saved. Quite a promise. Paul didn't always understand God's purposes, but he always understood God's promises. We need to be the same way. Read his promises, understand them, and then claim them. And Paul was quick to share these promises with the others who were on board that ship with him. Again, we need to do the same. No matter what situation we find ourselves in as believers, we are told that God will never, ever leave us or forsake us. He will always be with us. The, the saying goes, if you don't feel as close to God as you used to, he's not the one who has moved. And I think we can all relate to that every once in a while. But it's comforting to know he's not going anywhere. Another promise tells us that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8. Verses 38 and 39. Again, the letter that Paul wrote while all of this was going on in his life. Believers face hardships. They face persecution, imprisonment, even death. But we're not abandoned. We're not separated from Christ. And that is comforting to know. I got to speak to a believer, and I've, I've told you this before, I think, uh, on the telephone uh, in the back of the sanctuary there on uh, Good Friday, right after our service, uh, he is one of the January 6th prisoners 
and he is in jail still to this day, in solitary confinement, I might add. His name is Chris Alberts. Many of you wrote birthday cards to him. He had a birthday last month, and again, thank you for those of you who did. He is a committed believer in Jesus. We prayed on the phone, and uh, the Lord will get him through this. He's written a nice letter. I posted it on the ministry board downstairs. It's the middle board between the three. Read that letter uh, on your way out today. He's being imprisoned. He may die in prison. Depends on how long the current administration continues to go. And I don't know, 23 hours a day in solitary confinement is difficult. But he has not been abandoned by God. And as long as we keep praying for him and others like him, he won't be abandoned by us either. As believers, we also have the knowledge that when the time comes, we will not die alone. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we can fear no evil. Because the 23rd Psalm tells us, because God is with us. So God's given us a lot of promises in his word. Again, I have to ask, do you believe them? Do you rely on them? The time may come, it may be a life or death situation, where you'll be given the opportunity to rely on one of those promises. You don't know, but they're there for you just as they are there for Paul and all the others who we read about in Scripture, all the others down through the years of church history. So how do you think the sailors reacted in the midst of a hurricane? Hurricanes are no fun. They're especially not any fun out at sea. But how do you think they reacted when Paul told them that they would survive? I'm sure he said it with confidence. He knew. He had already been promised by the Lord. In verse 22 of Acts 27, Paul told them, be of good cheer. Maybe a little tough to do initially, again, in the midst of a hurricane. But again, Paul not only knew the one who sent the storm, he knew the one who could just as easily stop it. When we know that, we can have confidence. We can give reassurance or assurance and then reassurance to others in the face of difficulty. Paul also knew the one who allowed the problems in his life. And he allows problems in our life. But he also provides solutions. And if you have to wait a while for that to happen, to get an answer to your prayer, just understand there's a lesson in there to learn. It might just be that you need to be more patient. And I know we don't like that word. No human being I know likes to hear, be patient. But maybe the sailors who survived the storm with Paul needed to know first that all was hopeless, that all was helpless before they got to the point where they would consider trusting in Paul's God. So, yeah, why should it be any different with us? You've all had storms in your life. And you'll probably have a few more before God takes you home. But we can count on the same God that Paul was counting on to be there for us. Isaiah might have said it best, when he said, haven't you heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strength to the weak. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, Isaiah said. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's from Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. 
That's a promise. Even the strongest among us get tired, don't we? Every now and then you just feel like you're worn out. Physically, mentally, emotionally, it hits from all directions. Life gets us down. And then when life has you down, it kicks you. Right? Before you get up, you're going to feel it one more time. Life doesn't care about you. Have you figured that out yet? Life does not care about any of us, but God does. And he is never too tired, he is never too busy to listen and to help. So when you feel life crashing down on you, call on God. Call on him to renew your strength. You believe that he has the power to control all of life? even yours? Paul told the Corinthians that God's grace is sufficient. Sufficient in and through our weakness to enable us to withstand and to bear the trouble in which we find ourselves. To get through. We're all on a journey and God has a plan for each and every one of us. He told Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God knows the future for each of us. And as long as he's the one providing the agenda and going along with us every step of the way, as we fulfill our mission of serving him, that is our mission, then we can have boundless hope. Doesn't mean we're going to be spared any pain. Doesn't mean we're going to be spared any suffering. I give you the Apostle Paul as exhibit A. But God will see us through. He'll see us through to our glorious conclusion. Remember, he told Jeremiah that he would bring him to an expected end. Well, what is the expected end for a believer? Heaven, that is our end when we get to heaven. The most well-known scripture in the Bible is John 3, 16. That is also a promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal or everlasting life. That's a promise. You believe in him, you'll have everlasting life. Believe. Actually trust. Put everything you have on the Lord. And you'll go to heaven when you die. If anybody in here right now has not gotten to that point, anyone watching online, understand you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. But sin can't get into heaven. God doesn't allow it. God's perfect. Heaven's perfect. Sin is not perfect. It can't exist in heaven. You don't get there if you're a sinner. So we have a dilemma. How do we get rid of the sin? We don't. Only Jesus could do that. Jesus is God. So Jesus came into this earth and shed his perfect, precious, sinless blood to cover our sins, to wash them away. You believe it or not, more people don't believe that than do. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. There will be more people in hell than there will be in heaven. If you believe what Christ did, was true and real, and if you believe he did it for you, confess your sins to him. Ask him to forgive you. Tell him you're sorry, and then show him you're sorry by turning from those sins. It's called repentance. And as we say at communion every month, do that, and he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. 
and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Okay? So that we don't go back to all of those things. Paul confirms it in Ephesians 1 when he says that we're all blessed. We're blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he does that according to how he has chosen us before the foundation of the world, Paul told the Ephesians. So there you have it. That is God's perfect plan. He chose a people to save. Before he created the world or anything in it, he chose a group of people that he would save and take to heaven with him. We fell into sin, so he sent a savior to die for us, someone to pay the penalty for that sin. And then once that has happened, he sends us out into the world to do what? to spread the gospel message to others whom he has called, whom he has chosen, whom he has saved. And so the journey begins for each of us. We're his messengers. We're sent out there to find other believers. And he uses us as he sees fit. We're part of his will. It's not the other way around. We're to go out and share the gospel with others just like he sent someone to share it with us. We don't know all the specifics. We just know what we've been called to do, just like Paul was. And we have his promises on which to stand. We're trusting him for eternal life. But please remember, we can also trust him in this life as well. He'll care for us. He'll get us through all the challenges and the trials that are facing us right up until the moment that he's ready to take us home. That's where you get your true reward. And yes, you do have to die to get there, short of the rapture. We're going to heaven one day. Be excited about that. Tell others about it. You don't have to get in their face. You don't have to hit them with your Bible. But if they're hurting, talk to them. Say, let me share with you what, what God did for me when I was in trouble, when I was facing a difficult time in my life. Just tell them what God did for you. That's all. That's called a personal testimony. You're witnessing to them. And then let God take it from there. We're going to heaven where all of our troubles will be gone. Never, ever, ever to be heard from again. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for heaven. We thank you for what awaits us. But yet, Lord, we thank you for what we have in front of us here on earth. We have the opportunity to play a part in your plan of redemption. You have called people to you. You are drawing them to you. They will pass believers along that route. When they pass us, Lord, open our eyes and ears, open our mouths that we would say something to them to encourage that, the fact that you're drawing them. They're hearing things here. They're hearing things there. Seeds are being planted in their lives. They're starting to wonder, what's going on here? Maybe God is trying to reach me. Maybe he is trying to speak to me. Just say something. God will use that as he draws them in. Jesus said, no one comes to me, Jesus, unless they're first drawn by the Father. That's simple. So, Lord, we thank you for the part that we get to play in that. It's all we can do, but it's more than enough. So bless our day today, Lord, whatever awaits us, whatever detour we might have between here and our next destination, Lord. Have us not focus on a detour, but instead to look for the opportunities that lie therein. Thank you, Lord, for 
our time together this morning. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen.